Uh, you forget to do some things. I also forgot to turn down the air conditioning in here. Uh, so, hey, we had a parade today in Oakdale. Anybody watching from that parade, uh, thanks for coming out to the parade. Glad to see you there. I was there with the SEC group and um, had my sign out there and greeting everybody. So, yeah, we are live and uh, running on a tight clock. And when that happens, not everything's set up on time. So, <laughs> forgot to do some things. But we're ready to go now, I think. We'll see. Hey, uh, I was gone for a couple weeks here. Uh, my uncle, Bill Knuckles, passed away. And uh, appreciate all the well wishes and uh, stuff like that, but a great man. He coached at many places, Louisville, Idaho State, Whitworth, uh, boy, um, high school, college level, uh, but he was a great man, and his first love was uh, Jesus Christ. He made that known. Every school he was at, he got Bible studies going with the guys, and that got him in trouble, and so he ended up having to move a lot of different places, but uh, when he coached, his teams have winning track records, but I guess that's not, that wasn't enough, you know. Start talking about Jesus and uh, things get out of hand sometimes. Even at uh, so-called Christian schools, you know, get Bible studies going and the faculty would get, the Bible faculty would get jealous. Um, but he was a, a great man, a good role model for me. I would describe him as a faithful man. His wife had uh, MS for a long time, and at the age of 70, he was still carrying her around, you know, upstairs, whatever needed. And he was a strong man. And uh, But the last 18 years uh, of his life, uh, his back started getting bad, and... Uh, was hunched over quite a bit, but boy, he'd keep going. <laughs> great, great guy. So uh, thanks for Bob Zick for filling in. And, and then uh, last week, even though I was in town, I had an emergency meeting at the Republican headquarters about judicial stuff that didn't turn out. So we just played a replay, and we played a replay of the Grazzini Rucky, uh, uh, Michelle McDonald, Ooh, going dark, getting light. <laughs> oh, it's still trying to match colors. That's kind of what's going on here. So, yeah, little time to set up, like I said. Uh, so last week played the replay of the uh, interview with Michelle McDonald and Grazzini Rucky. Uh, hope you enjoyed that after all the news that's been going on over these years and in the paper. Uh, it was interesting to watch. Uh, and I didn't watch the whole thing, but uh, when uh, Sandra was on the show saying my daughters are missing, and yet she knew where they were. Um, but she was protecting them from, in her mind, somebody that was abusive. So um, I guess what would you do if you are children and you thought your children were being abused? Uh, what would you do to stop it? So, and there was a hearing on Monday, a pretrial, regarding uh, witnesses, what can be done, and how the whole trial is going to take place, and any motions that are going to come up, and, and just setting the schedule. And so we're going to talk about that later uh, at the end of the show, because it, it's just fascinating. It, it's things you need to know, uh, because more than likely, it's going to happen to you. <laughs> Okay, uh, you think you're clean, you think you're doing a good thing. Well, the Minnesota Supreme Court, or the U.S. Supreme Court, made it really, really, really tough on people now. And there's just things you need to be watching out for uh, in, in the long term here. Uh, and you're going to have to change your behaviors now that the Supreme Court has made different rules regarding uh, your Fourth Amendment right to need to have a warrant before you get searched or, or at least probable cause and the one ruling that's not being talked about came out uh, today um, on a Minnesota case of a man refusing a uh, breathalyzer test and so that's a fascinating read 
and you know you thought you had liberties and uh, evidently our constitution is superseded by prehistory uh, so it's, it's fascinating because they had a kind of split decision on breathalyzer test well that's okay to, to take without a uh, search warrant uh, but taking your blood is not okay without a search warrant fascinating stuff well <clears throat> Let's see, I want to go over a couple other things that happened quickly before we even get into that. Uh, but I don't know if you've been paying any attention to transgender sports, uh, men, boys, participating in girls' sports. And, of course, um, you know, in the mixed martial arts, you got a transgender guy fighting the women, and he's just destroying them. Uh, and, I mean, it's just not right. The, the, the man is a man, okay? He, his sex is male, and just because he thinks he's a woman, he gets to fight as a woman. Makes no sense. And women are getting hurt because of this. Uh, and I think a lot of these women are refusing to fight him, as well they should. And uh, the mixed martial arts community needs to get their head together here uh, pretty quickly on this deal. But it's also happening in high school track and field meets uh, where guys are competing against girls and they're losing, uh, but they are placing. And, some, um, and so that is taking a girl out of a position just because the kid thinks that he's a girl. When every cell in his body says his sex is male. So, so something's seriously wrong, and this has got to stop, and people need to speak up. And it can't just be a TV show or a commentator here or there. You need to go down to the St. Paul School Board, and of course, a lot of the, and, and other school boards and your legislature, and a lot of reasons that there are so many problems in our schools, and we've got some St. Paul school clips to play because Valeria Silva is gone. Um, as superintendent uh, is because of this mixed up thinking and can they think that way yes but the majority of the people who think correctly should be speaking out and standing up and and, and the reality is they're not and they're not doing what they need to do uh, in order out in order to speak against this crazy thinking uh, and and that's why the other side uh, is is winning, winning the side that doesn't think straight. But what happens, like in the St. Paul School, is, is essentially you get chaos. And with that chaos, you, you can't function as a society. And, and that's what's happening. So we have this intentional breakdown of our society, which is what certain people want so they can take control over your life. Um, and e even to that extent, Obama made a ruling, administrative ruling, that churches are now forced to buy insurance that cover for abortions, even though the Supreme Court says, no, you can't do that. <laughs> you know? But Obama says we're doing it anyway. So it's um, churches in California and other places, you know, y you're going to have to learn how to stand up and say no. This is against our religious values or religious beliefs. Of course, you didn't stand up because you're paying for taxes or for abortions through your taxes. Uh, of course, the church isn't, but the people are, uh, especially here in Minnesota. And because the leaders here don't know how to stand up and how to uh, protest and how to organize, um, they get ran over. And... Maybe that's all right, you know. So, you know, go after them. <laughs> you're not, yeah, maybe you're not going at, after them hard enough. Hey, uh, the other big news, which I haven't, maybe the uh, control room can find out, is there was a vote on the European Union or Britain getting out of uh, the European Union. And I don't know how that vote came down. Uh, the poll should be closed. So they are leaving the European Union, or you're going to check on it? You're going to check on it, okay. And 
we'll get that. that. That's a big thing. Now, one of the big claims, which as I don't know is true because there's mixed messages coming out uh, from the press. One, the new head of the European Union from, I believe it's uh, Czechoslovakia, uh, has vowed to protect religious freedom and churches and, and stuff like that from Muslims' persecution or Islam's persecution. I don't see the difference. Uh, some people say there's a difference. I, I don't get it. Uh, it. To me, it's one and the same. Uh, maybe I should be able to get it, but I don't. <laughs> uh, I think they're trying to make a distinction um, t to confuse people. Um, so uh, maybe the mu Muslims and the individual and Islam is the group. Uh, but what's the difference, you know? Uh, so the, the, the Britain, the people wanting the Brit to uh, exit Brexit or what, as they call it, are, are organizing to try. And one of the big things they're saying is we need control because the European Union is uh, taking away our liberties to control our people and they're forcing us to immigrate people we don't want to immigrate. 5.2% reporting? Oh, only 5.2% reporting and it's right now leave the European Union. So that's, we don't know what that, <laughs> you know, that's early but it's a close 51%, uh, 50, almost 52% saying let's uh, leave. So that this will be a big deal. This will be a huge deal. Now, from my perspective, uh, it could be the beginning of the end or a new organization. And the new organization, Britain will make combined with others or the European Union will form another group. And if they only have 10 people, countries in that group, watch out. You know, are they going to be Muslim countries that are um, part of this economic union? How is Rome going to tie into this? Uh, where is the United States uh, going to fit in? This could be the beginning of the end of uh, civilization as we know it. I, I just, it's getting bad out there and your liberty is at stake. And the Supreme Court decisions have not helped uh, in this matter uh, at, at all. And you just got to understand with the, your uh the relaxation on the Fourth Amendment that's been taking place. The, the biggest issue for doing an unscheduled un, uh, a search that's illegal is that, and police officers have been known to do it, not that they're, all of them are going to do it, but they have done it, is planning on evidence after they've searched you or while they're searching you. And you can't then now in the past, you can say that's an illegal search because you stopped me without cause and, and, and then planted it. Well, now they can stop you without cause and say they found something. Well, it's, it's a little more nuanced than that, but uh, it's, it's not good. <laughs> okay. So let's go to uh, St. Paul Schools here. And this is a big news event that took place and the reasons for Silva being uh, fired or relieved of duties or a contract being brought out bought out for about seven hundred seventy five thousand um, dollars is because of the disruption the lack of discipline or as they call classroom climate was so bad and the way the teachers were being treated was bad um, and, and really, the only person speaking out for years, well, there's a couple, but uh, Bob Zick started it. And then guys like Greg Copeland will come in and speak and ask for Silva uh, to be fired. And then finally, other school teachers who were being abused by the system spoke up. And then finally, the press covered uh, the students uh, beating up teachers or yelling at teachers. So uh, it just escalated. But Bob Zick was the one that was uh, taking the lead and stepping up to the plate. And he took a lot of ridicule for that. 
uh, but he was right. Uh, but he doesn't care uh, because uh, that's the way he is. He wants to expose what's going on. And he's done that time after time. And mostly the Democrats have bashed him uh, for doing that. Uh, but he's found out to be right. So why do the Democrats not want this transparency? I'm not saying that Republicans aren't for transparency, don't want transparency either. I'm not saying that, but in this case, that's what was happening. Um, so uh, Superintendent Silva has uh, her contract bought out. And let's watch what uh, uh, Bob Zick had to say about her contract and her leaving. Oh, that's, oh, oh, wait, that's not context. it. Come back to me here. In that spirit, come back to me. All right, did we, uh, to get, did that other file from the hard drive get put in yet? Okay, that's the one I want to play. Good evening, board. That's it. I am Bob Zick. Uh, cable channel 15, 8.30 to 9.30 p.m., Insight, Insight News Hour. I, for one, do not want the superintendent expelled. I like the board that advocates restorative justice and restitution. That's what has to take place here. Teachers and custodians are being eliminated and the super gets a golden parachute. Her contract allows for reassignment as a teacher put her in as a lead substitute teacher so she can experience the havoc and disruption she has put on the St. Paul School teachers. <laughs> All goals have to have measurable outcomes. The superintendent's goals have received a failure and have been destructive. The Star Tribune, June 18th, Silva steps down, i.e. expelled. Declining enrollment, driving a $15 million deficit. Students on staff violence. Retaliation and, and stifle teachers who were critical of her policies. There's a petition demanding Silva's ouster. Puffed graduation rates while state proficiency tests fall to only 40% comment was move the phony plastic plants and relate to the citizens. <laughs> Joe, Joe Sushri's column, which is Sunday, last Sunday, June 19th, another super, it doesn't matter who, talks about the super club and the brain trust. Taxpayers to buy the super out. When all is said and done, about a million dollars. Falling scores in student violence. Zick, your the time is up. The race-baiting Pacific Education Group from San Francisco. Ms. And Zick, finally, your the time dog and is up. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Moore? <laughs> well, he, he did a really good job there. Because, you know, he used the words that uh, the school board used uh, in the superintendent used against them uh, and of course he's saying that yeah gives Silva a job uh, substitute teaching so she can see what it's like uh, I'm saying give her a job that she's monitoring the re the bathrooms you know so the children can be safe um, cause that's that was her policy you know, in the con they didn't have to buy out the contract. They they could give her a job suitable to her education uh, or less, but they could have given her a job in the public schools, uh, paid her a salary commensurate. They would have had to pay the difference, but she probably would have resigned. That's that's the big thing. She would have then resigned, and they wouldn't have to do the buyout. Uh, so. But the uh, new school board decided to do differently. Uh, but let's understand, the old school board uh, was arrogant. 
They were defiant. They were not listening to the people, and they got blown out, you know, four for four, got blown out. Of course, at least one of them, I believe, didn't run. But, you know, to, I guess, to a surprise, because somebody, one of the school board members was up for election, wasn't up for election that time, so she was still on one of the old school board members, but she didn't like the new direction where the school board was going. So we're going to play the next video and see what she has to say about the school board. So let's hear Gene O'Connell. So this is a difficult day in the history of this school board, and I feel a need to put this moment in context. In that spirit and in contradiction with the recent civic discussion, it is vitally important that this board and the people who care about public education in St. Paul understand that the children of St. Paul Public Schools have seen significant improvements in their education in the past six years. Are we where we wanna be? No. Has it improved? Yes, and I'd like to highlight some of those improvements. Shortly after I joined the board, we hired a new superintendent, a career St. Paul Public Schools educator who has helped us navigate many challenges in the past six and a half years. We've made decisions and gone directions I never would have predicted. This school district has led our city's conversation about racial equity. It has been and continues to be difficult and challenging work. Have we solved all the problems? Of course not. Are we talking about race in more meaningful ways than we have ever done before? Oh yes, we are. Those conversations were instigated and led by Superintendent Silva. Has it been non-controversial, clear and concise, fast and easy? No, this is difficult social change. But we have looked at our results as a school district and we've established goals in very different ways, leading to changes in how we approach curriculum, discipline, special education, hiring practices, and even the food that we serve in our cafeterias. I would like to thank staff and community members who have accelerated my personal growth as a racial equity advocate. It's hard to remember a time when racial equity concerns were not on my radar, but that certainly was the case and it wasn't very long ago. I'm thankful for the tough discussions with board, staff, and community members about the personal and systemic changes that are needed to make it possible for all of our children to succeed. What, what's amazing to me is that there was nothing about content of character, you know, uh, students' character, parents' characters improving. Uh, the administration's character improving. Uh, it was all about race and rights. Well, yeah, I mean, you do have rights, but uh, and you should have rights, but all these challenges and all their discussion, they made the wrong decisions, okay, in, in this process, in this process that started tearing apart St. Paul schools, classroom climate, like, which means classroom discipline. And they say, oh, great improvements in education, but they graduated more people, but they lost the level of knowledge went down. Okay, so they may have graduated more people, but their achievements, their learning uh, scores went down. So you know, you can spin this a lot of different ways, but uh, the, the end result is people get it. They get what's going on, and they figured out it wasn't working. So, Gene O'Connell, you may be uh, thinking you achieved some great things. Well, you didn't. You didn't achieve great things. You made it worse for the city, and your leadership was not it was leading in the wrong direction, a Pied Piper of, of things that, that will not help a society at all. Let's go and finish, uh, do the next clip and finish her speech.
And this is why I have felt the need to put the events of the past year into perspective. Because if we believe the things that were said during last year's school board campaigns and that have been said in this room in recent months, you would think this is a failing school district, not one of the highest performing urban school districts in the country. We all share responsibility in this. I regret that in our efforts to focus on what needs improvement, that we have neglected to share success stories in equal measure. There's plenty of blame to go around, and I accept my fair share of it. I would hope others at this table and in this room would accept theirs. None of my colleagues sitting at this table hold a superintendent or a principal license. But regularly, people who have experience and knowledge to give us recommendations have been ignored, aggressively questioned, or assumed to be wrong by this board. I am personally taken aback by the way the current chair and treasurer of this board have worked in secret and frozen other members of this board out of major issues, up to and including the decision to buy out the superintendent. Not only is this questionable governance, it is terrible leadership. St. Paul is a high-performing urban school district. Right now, it does not have a high-performing school board. This board needs to work together with the interim superintendent, administration, and the entire community to refocus on the needs of our children. Our schools are bigger than the superintendent, and they are bigger than me, and they're bigger than the other board members here. With the continued support of this entire community, and I hope a more realistic conversation about where we are today and where we want to be in the future, this school district will continue to be a tremendous asset to this city. But the environment at this table has become so disrespectful, destructive, and cynical that I can no longer be a part of it. I'm resigning my position on the school board effective June 30th of this year. It's been a great honor to work on behalf of the children of St. Paul. The future of the city is determined by how we treat them. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to serve. Wow. Uh, it's, it's amazing to me that she has the audacity to talk about transparency uh, because she was part of the group that didn't want public comments, didn't want them seen out there, didn't want the people know of the problems uh, of discipline that the schools was having. She was the one that was hiding things. Now, she didn't want, until we came in, Bob Zick and I came in, started filming the, uh, uh, they have a, a separate board meeting, the meeting of the board or something like that, um, that's not televised. We came in, started televising that, <laughs> you know, uh, they didn't, they weren't letting you televise that with the other administration. And with the new administration, we started televising that. So if she wants to talk about lack of transparency, she's the one doing it. You know, so this hypocritical Gene O'Connell, and then to go and say, I'm taking my ball and going home. You know, you don't get to play. I'm not playing with you anymore you know, is, is outrageous. You know, she should be the voice and she should bring for her side. You know, she was elected by her side to give that voice. And now because she's in the minority, she wants to cry and go away. I mean, you know, that to me shows the nature of that school board that we had in the past in St. Paul. You know, um, oh, things aren't going my way. I'm, I'm going to cry and give up, you know, instead of send the message that I was asked to send. Uh, it's really bad. Uh, now, on the new scored school board member, uh, uh, superintendent, intern superintendent, he's also part of this Pacific Foundation out of San Francisco that has brought Silva's equity 
uh, program, racial equity program together that St. Paul School spent, spent $3 million on uh, this group. Um, there's not going to be any change. And what you didn't hear was the school board asking, well, how was Roseville, because that's where it came from, how was Roseville doing as far as equity or, or graduation rates? You know, and my understanding is the, the white kids were getting 90% graduation and the ethnic kids were getting about 40%. So he had a big gap too. So what kind of thing is he going to bring to raise up the uh, racial gap? Uh, I, I don't know that he can do it because it's part of that Pacific Foundation where things are based on race rather than character, you know, and instilling character. And you had people at that school board that said, hey, uh, you know, that were ethnic diversity people saying, hey, you know what? Why I did so well in school? Because the teachers built and instilled character into the students. And, and with their discipline prom problems at the school or this classroom climate, as they call it, they weren't, uh, you, you, you weren't instilling discipline and uh, you can't have a classroom, you can't have a, you can't have a school, you can't have a society uh, that way. So, well, St. Paul, um, I mean, you, new school board, you're trying to do things, but don't, don't do the same mistake all, all over again. <laughs> okay, oh, let's see, where else do we got here now? Oh, remind you, okay, this is a live talking show, June 23rd. If you got a question or comment, call in 651-747-3838. Uh, you can see past shows at youtube.com forward slash speechlessmn. If you want to email me, speechlessmn at gmail. Uh, appreciate the email I got from uh, somebody out of state here again, a um, uh, different state saying, hey, keep up the good work, love your show. Uh, this kind of stuff about the courts needs to be exposed. So that's what we're going to get into now with the courts. Uh, spent this week in, in, in a number of courtrooms. And I can find out where I'm at here. Um, oh, yeah, the state versus Diana Longry was at that courtroom hearing today. And it was an interesting motion, a motion to remove the prosecutor for uh, political prosecution or bias because that prosecuting firm used to be the prosecuting firm for Maplewood when Diana Longy was the mayor of Maplewood. And she caught them going and uh, at least the law firm, uh, Mr. Kelly, um, giving away to the press client, private client information leaking to the press. And of course, uh, Diana Longry was in a bad situation with the city administrator because she wasn't their type of Democrat. So the city administration was fighting against her as well as the law firm. <laughs> and essentially, uh, the uh, Kelly, which is now the Kelly and Lemons law firm, um, they voluntarily uh, walked away from a $300,000 a year contract. Why would you do that? Because they got caught doing an unethical behavior. And so Diana is saying, hey, Kelly and Lemon, you can't come after me as a prosecutor because your, your motives aren't pure. You know, this is a political witch hunt. So that hearing was going on today, which, which was fa fascinating, but was really interesting is that the, the law firm didn't have a reply brief, a responsive brief to Diana's accusations. They just came in and said, hey, we're the prosecutor and uh, we think she committed a crime by taking out these public documents uh, meant for the public to read and look at and disseminated to the public. And, and uh, a lot of other people walked out with uh, documents. And, you know, I think this is politically motivated. And if any other law firm were to look at this, they'd let it go. It's not worth it. So now Maplewood is spending thousands of dollars 
on uh, Maplewood, uh, on this prosecution <laughs> of, of Diana uh, for something that was only, well, they say it was $125, but uh, 20, you know, at the time they were saying it was a $25 book, so they're spending thousands of dollars trying to get this public document back. All right, we got a phone call here, so caller, uh, you have a comment or question? First of all, I have a comment. Yeah. Excellent show, Tim. You're, you're just covering things fantastically. The Thank you. The thing I want to drag you off to the side with to make a comment on, that idiot Paul Ryan, they're talking about banning, you know, guns from people on the no-fly list, and he doesn't want to hear about it. I mean, I'm a conservative, but why in the hell are we allowing people in the no-fly list to buy guns? 97% of them are criminals. There's 3% that may not be, but... I mean, don't we go in the preponderance of safety for the, for, the, for the majority? I mean, that's just common sense. If you comment, I'll hang up and I'll listen. Yeah, uh, thank you. Uh, that, that's a good statement. Um, but real quickly here, you know, based on if they've already been prosecuted and they're on the no-fly list, uh, they, don't, they can't have a gun anyway. So you have to get the liberty so, of people. So they're they're uh, being redundant, you know, in the case, but you also have to do, have due process in order to take away uh, gun rights. The no-fly list, I don't think there's due process that's take, been taken into account there. Um, you know, I don't know what the criteria to get on the no-fly list is, but if you're not an American citizen, of course you don't have the right to bear arms. Uh, in the United States. So, um, you know, I, I, I hear what you're saying, but they, I don't think they could automatically uh, just ban somebody from having a gun because they're on the no-fly list. There has to be some, some greater cause to take away their rights to own a gun. Now, there could, you know, People in the United States, you got a no contact order or no order for protection. Uh, the judge will oftentimes order the guns to be sold if you own them or to be taken away and, and locked up until the order for protection is done. Uh, so, but there was due process in that taking, in, in, that, in that instance. So is there due process taking place here? Have these people had it? Uh, and I don't know that that happens on the no-fly list. So, uh, because people show up on that no-fly list that had no idea they were on it, you know, when they go to the airport. So, uh, you know, uh, if that's Ryan's reason for not supporting it, I can understand that. Uh, making twist, tweaks to that, probably a lot of these people can't own guns anyway. So who knows, but... Then again, when does it, uh, making it so a person can't own a gun, how does that stop them from owning a gun? It, it, it doesn't. It just hurts the people that uh, can lawfully own guns but don't, and don't defend themselves. All right. Well, in State versus Longry, uh, the judge took it under advisement, and, you know, the, the defense of the attorney's firm was... Um, we're just doing our job, <laughs> but we'll see, uh, you know, with, without them having a reply brief, uh, Diana's statements go on the record. Uh, now I thought she could have really piled it on, uh, by saying that, uh, look, this has been ongoing. The judge was kind of uncertain about, well, that was 10 years ago. What about today? Well, what about during the whole 10 years and she could have had witnesses come up but the judge really didn't want witnesses but she could have had witnesses come up and say hey you know over this last 10 years uh, Diana and other people have been nothing but harangued harassed uh, had their cable TV shows eliminated from the city of Maplewood uh, because they don't like what they're saying and what they're exposing about the administration of Maplewood you know, so that could have been part of the evidence. It could have really been some piling on. 
But I think uh, with the evidence that Diana presented, it should be enough to say, hey, get a different law firm, get a different city to prosecute this and see if they think it's worth it. You know, why, why not do that? Uh, and my understanding, there's no statute of limitation upon uh, lawyers who have prosecuted or uh, have, uh, have had unethical behaviors uh, from, from not being recused from prosecuting. It's a, it's a new area in Minnesota law that's being exposed, how to remove a prosecutor uh, for potential bias. Uh, there are, is no statutory structure to that. Okay, boy, we are running out of time. Uh, big U.S. Supreme Court case, Utah versus Strife. Uh, here's the takeaway from that, and this is about Fourth Amendment right of search and, search and seizures and, and warrantless arrests and things like that. Um, you're going to have to change your behavior, all right? It, it's just simple as that with this ruling. Because now a police officer can stop you illegally, and if you have an unpaid, if you have a warrant out for your arrest, then that stop ends up not becoming legal, but they can still arrest you for the warrant with no re repercussions. <clears throat> now, why is this a good thing or a bad thing? <laughs> well, one, it really weakens the Fourth Amendment. Uh, did we lose the call there? Uh, it, it weakens the Fourth Amendment in, in that a police officer can now stop you for any reason. The good point is that if they stop you and you have no warrants, and they, uh, then you can now go after them and sue them for violating your Fourth Amendment right. Okay, so they can't do the search. There's no warrants. There's no probable cause for the search whatever, now you can get them. So the police officers still have to watch what they're doing. So if you got outstanding tickets, you got an outstanding warrant, my thing would say, take care of it, get it done, okay? And now you have the potentiality of actually suing the police department for an unlawful stop. Um, now on the other end, so what the police department has to watch out and the cities have to watch out is for these type of lawsuits. So are they still going to go out and stop people uh, illegally? Uh, so there's two ends to this thing, you know, and I think it went too far uh, if they stop you. And of course, you see, the deal is if you're, if you got a warrant out for your arrest, they can just pick you up. Okay. But this officer didn't know there was a warrant out for this guy's arrest and he stopped him and then searched for the warrant and then searched the guy and then found the drugs. Okay, so I, I just think the Supreme Court went too far as, as far as saying, hey, yeah, the stop was illegal, but the guy had a warrant. Well, it's supposed to be the other way around and they went too far. But I also think the dissent went too far. Uh, with Sotomayor, I think, uh, just really went on an emotional rant, it, it, which goes to my point that the justice of the Supreme Court of any court, once they get there, they all they have to do is have a pre, uh, presumption of following the law. Uh, that's not the right word, presumption, but uh, they have to have a pretense. They, that they're following the law. That's all they need. And then these nine justices, whatever they decide, whoever gets in the majority, that ends up being the law of the land. Okay, <clears throat> so uh, watch out out there. Go and read Utah versus Strife. Uh, very, very interesting read. And you need to understand it because it's about your liberty. I, I'm telling you, if you've done nothing wrong, you need to read it. And, and here's my concern because now they can pull you over, anything, and now they can plant evidence on you. And you can't stop them from doing it because it'd still be a legal stop. It's an illegal stop, but now that they've done it, you know, <laughs> it, it's a mess. 
Okay, and uh, a big another ruling came out today, and I haven't had a chance to go through all of it, but uh, it was uh, Birchfield versus North Dakota. It was actually three cases, but uh, that's going that's the primary name. But it dealt with drunk driving, and this was uh, kind of like the Michelle McDonald uh, case where she denied taking a blood test because she wanted to go in front of a judge. So, and I think Michelle McDonald can still, uh, she's still appealing her case. Uh, I don't know what aspect of it uh, to the Minnesota Supreme Court. Uh, but this case said, it came out today, if you get stopped for uh, DUI, and if they have probable cause and, and arrest you, that you do have to take a blood test through the implied consent, uh, 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 a breath test through the implied consent. Now they didn't distinguish between a breath test on the road, which Michelle McDonald was uh, not offered, and a breath, the breath test down at the intoxilizer test down at the station. Uh, they didn't do that distinguishing here that I can read. What they did uh, say though is that you without a search warrant do not have to give a blood test. Okay, so a blood test was illegal. They had three cases going here. One was a Minnesota case, North Dakota and Minnesota and one other state. So a breath test, yes, a blood test, no, because a blood test is so invasive uh, versus uh, breath test isn't as invasive. So I got more reading to do on that uh, and Michelle's test is, uh, McDonald's test is a little different because she did not, uh, uh, she asked to go in front of a judge uh, and get that warrant uh, first and then have the judge determine right away. But the appellate courts changed what the definition of the word immediately is. Of course, we all think immediately, you know, you know, immediately got up and left, you know, that type of thing. Okay, I'm leaving, goodbye, immediately left. Well, uh, in legal terms, immediately now means a couple days, you know, the next available time. Uh, it's, it's just bizarre be, beyond bizarre. And that's what you find going on in courts. They'll use the same definition, they'll use the same word and change the definition in the same sentence depending on the circumstances. <laughs> that's just unbelievable, uh, the game that goes on. Okay, uh, went to a Rucky, Grazzini Rucky case pretrial. Fascinating case. The state was making a motion. Uh, they're going to use use immunity for the fa couple that had the girls uh, under protection uh, from their dad. That's their claim. Uh, it had reasonable belief to believe that the children would be harmed, which is a positive defense to the criminal statute of deprivation of parental rights. So uh, there was a motion by the state that's going to come up to use use immunity that happens the day of the trial. Uh, it's also being used against uh, Deidre Evervold, uh, who uh, is being accused of taking the girls up to the family. And this use immunity would, it's not blanket immunity, but there's restrictions. So that would force these people so that they have to testify. And if they get caught lying, that could be used against them. Or if they find uh, other evidence you, um, from other people that is totally unrelated to the evidence they provide and there's no connection between that evidence they provide, then they can be charged uh, with the crime. Uh, and it sounds like this is something that uh, they have to do. If it's offered, they have to testify. So. That's just an interesting thing. That was used in Watergate, or the, no, the Iran-Contra hearings, I believe, was use immunity was offered. Um, it's not likely that they're going to find these people will then be charged with, with, a, with a crime because 
they weren't hiding anything anyway, <laughs> you know. So this is all going against evidence against um, um, Sandra Grazini Rucky. What was interesting, the judge asked uh, uh, Sandra Grazini Rucky's attorney, Stephen Grigsby, uh, do you have anything to say on this issue? And Stephen Grigsby rightly said, no, I, I don't have standing here because he doesn't represent these people. He doesn't represent Evavold or the Dolans. So he can't speak on their behalf. You know, he's only, he can only speak on Sanders' behalf. Well, what, what other thing that was interesting is there was a motion to compel discovery, and that was brought by the state. Uh, the state wanted to know who the witnesses were going to be. Uh, they said they had no idea who they are or, or what, this, what they expect. So Grigsby has about 110 to 130 witnesses uh, ready to go, I mean, on his list. But here the state, in, in offering a motion to compel for Grigsby to provide information, the state hasn't given their witness list, hasn't said what evidence they're going to give. And, and actually there's a big argument going on well, the state is saying, hey, we got this evidence, and Grigsby's saying, give it to us, and the state's saying, no, give us the money for the evidence. I never knew this. If you're, if you're being charged with a crime and the state has evidence against you, 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 you have a right to the copy uh, of that evidence and to see that evidence, but guess what? You have to pay for it. Or you can go in and, and, and look at it. It keeps in the possession of the state, you know, like if it's a shirt that's torn or... You know, you don't get to have possession of that. But transcripts, uh, documents, uh, things that can be digitized or electronic, you, you have to pay for that. Now, from attorneys I've talked to, I've heard that's usually a, a $20 fee. But Dakota, for some reason, I know they're charging D.D. Evavold uh, about $300 on two different sets of documents. And Dee Dee's saying, no, this is data practice. I can get this from data practice, you know, which is free, and it's evidence against me. But the court rules, not a statute, not a law, court rules say you have to, you have to pay for this evidence. And, um, but, but what's interesting is the state, well, Grigsby's argument is, look, give us the evidence and bill us, and, and we'll pay you. But see, Sandra has gone on informer pauperous. Now it's confusing as to why. How can this person who was once very, very wealthy be an informer pauperous? Is because through attorneys' fees and through rulings by Judge Knutson and other judges, they've taken all her money. You know, um, over a million and a half, and plus with homes and other things. You know, I'd say it's rack, racked up to around two two million dollars that she does not have and have access to. So, Sandra got a informer paupers in February that Judge Aspa, who's the judge on this case, gave her it's for a year. We get back into the court and they're talking about attorneys' fees, are uh, talking about paying for this data. And you don't have to pay for that if you're in former pauperous. And the judge goes, well, you know, you have to fill out a new form and you need to disclose all your sources of income. And she doesn't have any, <laughs> you know. Her job's been taken away. Uh, it's on suspension because of this case. She can't fly because of the restrictions the court put on her. And the court's going... Uh, oh, yeah, so what if I, I mean, they didn't say this, but so what if I issued an uh, IFP, uh, informer pauperous, for uh, a year and I just did it three months ago? You got to do it again. This time disclose everything. Okay, so they filled it out again and sent it in, you know. So Dakota County is playing this game of uh, you pay for your evidence, you pay for it first, and Stephen Grigsby, the defense attorney for Santa Grazina Rucky, is saying, hey, look, this is just like any other transaction. You have responsibility to give the evidence, you bill us, then we pay you. Okay, so 
you know, do it that way. So the judge is going to have to make a decision on that because there was nothing in the rules on that issue. Uh, so uh, June 29th, they have to have all their witnesses, and the state finally said, well, we got about 10 or 12 witnesses. Now, one of the witnesses has died. Uh, their primary witness has died, uh, Del Nathan, and who's been on this show. And what, what's going to, you know, the state hasn't said who their witnesses are going to be. Well, that makes a big difference as to who the defense is going to call as witnesses. So the state says they have a lot of witnesses, but it's going to be pared down to 10 or 15. And so Grigsby's witnesses are going to be based on that. So it's, it's interesting, uh, you know, how all this is working. Oh, and besides that, lawsuits are now coming out that are violating the freedom of the press. Two blog sites, Red Herring Alert and Carver County Corruption, have been threatened with a lawsuit that if they don't shut down, uh, they're going to be sued. Carver County just shut down, but Red Herring Alert is not. We'll see what happens there. Uh, so much for freedom of the press. So, anyway show's over. Thanks for watching. Remember, if you don't stand up for other people's liberties, who's going to stand up for yours? And good men don't do nothing. God bless. Have a great week. You said to me that